Lord, not my words, your words, not my thoughts, your thoughts. Be with us now and always. Amen. <clears throat> if you were in church last week, um, not this service, but, but the other service, you would have seen that the passage we're reading on, it says, afterwards they realized that Jesus and his disciples were no longer there. But what happened before that? Before that, Jesus had seated them all down and had fed them with five loaves of bread and two fish, about 5,000 men. That's what we told. And then on top of all that, they go and they collect up a number of baskets of food and they take that with them. And so what is today we see? What actually happens is, is that the, the, these followers are not following Jesus to hear the word or to be able to give their lives to Jesus or anything else like that. They unfortunately, like most of us still today, and that is we go off and we go buy the lotto ticket because we think what would happen if we win that 140 million rand that was being played for last night. I would never have to work again. All my problems would be cured and I wouldn't have any needs of anybody or anything. I'm not knocking anybody that bought the locker ticket, but anybody that tells me they buy the locker ticket because they want to give to the poor, I'm telling them oh, they're a liar. They're buying it because they want to win the money. <clears throat> and so it is the same here. Those people that have come sit there and think, wow, this is amazing. I could actually not have to work anymore. I won't have to worry about anything. If this man becomes our king, he will make sure that we are fed. Our barns will be overflowing. Our treasure chests will be full. We would have the best socialistic system in the world. And Jesus is saying to them, guys, you've got it wrong. You missed the boat. I know you missed the boat. I was on it. Come on, guys. And so he says to them, you need the true bread of life. You need the water of life, of everlasting life. And so he starts explaining to them what this is. And they make every single solitary excuse they possibly can find. Okay, Jesus, so what is the signs going to be that we know this is the true bread of life? Guys, these guys, they've just seen Jesus curing people and feeding them, 5,000 of them, by breaking loaves. What other signs do you want? A ticker tape across the sky. Even then, we'd still have confusion and people would misread it. Then they find another excuse. Okay, so what do we have to do to get this bread of life? Hoping Jesus says to them, nothing, just stick around with me and you're fine, you're okay. You don't have to do anything. How many of you have friends who, during college or varsity, have decided that their way of going through varsity is not doing anything, just sticking around? They don't stick around very long. They up and leave. And so it is the same. Jesus is saying to them, if you want this bread of life, you have to follow me. And it's, I'm not living in golden palaces and driving Lani cars. I'm doing the hard slog. I'm walking the roads. I'm preaching to the unheard. I'm loving and caring for the homeless. I'm out there for you. For my father. The second, then they find another excuse. Well, what about the manna? You know, Moses gave us manna. That was sustaining, that fed them. Every day they had it. 
And Jesus' answer is, is, whoa, stop the boat. You've missed the point. It wasn't Moses. It was my father. It was God the Father that gave the manna. Not Moses. Moses was purely the conduit, the one who told you that you're going to get the bread. God didn't want to give it. He wouldn't have given it. And yet you still didn't understand this bread. You still collected more than you needed. You still were looking after your hunger, not after your eternal life. As soon as the bread stopped, you forgot God. And so the bread I'm talking about is the bread that you will never hunger after. You will never thirst for after. The bread Jesus is talking about is the body and blood of Christ. That which we're coming to share later on at the altar. The bread and the cup that Jesus is talking about is the bread of His own body and the cup of resurrection. He wants to share that with us so that we will never hunger or thirst ever again. Not physically, but spiritually. Because we will be able to follow Him it's not about the five easy points of becoming a Christian. It's not about, well, if I give you a hundred rand, you'll give me back a hundred rand. Or it's not about, there's no dabblings. It's about time. It's about spending time with Christ. This sound maybe very off the point. When they built Menland Shopping Center, not the last phase, the phase before that, I was, I knew the company that, or I knew the one of the guys from the company that were building it. And they went out and they planned Menland. And they looked at the group of people that had the highest disposable income. The highest disposable income. Those that had money to throw around. Unfortunately, most of you are in that age group. It was from 13 to 25. Because the problem was, was that the parents just threw money at the kids. It's much easier to give my child 300 rand than spend the time with my child. It's much easier just to make sure my child doesn't need anything and look after themselves. When you start reaching the age of 25, ask David and David and Johnny and the others that are getting sort of that age, you start settling down and there's, there's a house and then there's a car and then there's broken washing machine and before you know it, you start working with a budget and the money that you had is, is, is really tight and you've gone from having the highest disposable income to the lowest disposable income, even though your earning power has increased. And so it is the same thing. Jesus is saying to us, it's not about throwing things at Him. It's not about getting somebody, employing somebody to do a job instead of doing it yourself. One of the biggest problems that took place in the Reformation was that what the kings would do is they would take their slave and they'd say to their servant, okay, today I'm paying you to go to church for me. So you'd sit in church and the, the church was saying that if you do not go to church every Sunday, you're going to hell. So he would come to church and he would sit in church for his boss. And then he'd have to walk out and come back in to sit for his, in church for, his, for, for the madam. And then he had to find another service to go sit there for himself, otherwise he was going to go to hell. Now how fair is that? 
I can tell you now that if I started preaching that, I'd have a church full of homeless people. All because somebody would have paid them to come to church for them. It's about the hard grind. It's about getting to that relationship. It's about physically sitting with Christ. This last week, Martin and maybe a couple of you went to Tux Mission. And I was amazed. There was this young Afrikaans girl that knew nothing about old spirituality. She was a reformed person through and through. And she's just come from back from Thailand. And she's been doing missionary work to Buddhists. And she started telling me about old spirituality that I haven't heard from anybody forever and ever, including monks and priests. She spoke to us about how we should go into time of meditation, how we should sit and listen in the presence of God and hear Him speaking to us. She spoke about how if we really want to know the Scriptures, we should chant the Scriptures. Okay, excuse me, what? We should chant the Scriptures. Because by chanting them, it will be repeating, and you and I would know the Scriptures off by heart. Remember, the time that she was talking about, because she did refer to the early Christians, most people couldn't, Read or write. Another lovely story I remember is from the Rooted in Jesus. And there's one pastor who lives in a town and 25 kilometers away from where he stays is a Bible. So in the Monday morning, he gets up and he walks 25 kilometers and he gets there, and he studies the Word. He studies this next Sunday Scripture. He reads it, and he reads it, and he reads it. And tomorrow morning, he gets up, and he takes a tin, and he puts a stone in it, and he walks back, chanting that passage that he just read, so that he remembers it. So next Sunday, when he stands up to preach, he knows the Gospel that he's preaching on. He knows the word that he is sharing. Because of the lack of resources. When you or I get tossed, what's John 3.16? Just hold on, let me just get to open the Bible app. I'm not knocking modern technology. It's beautiful. There are more people studying theology, not physically, but through different ways of reading it. We've had wonderful opportunities here of hearing people from within this own congregation spreading and talking the Word. They're not studying theology at varsity. They haven't gone and done a course on systematic theology or biblical studies. They found it online and they've worked through it and they're working with it and they're sharing with other people. If we take Christianity honestly and seriously, we ourselves are going to be spending time studying and learning it and bringing it back into this community. I had a conversation with somebody that used to be in the evening service. She left. She's now come back. She's back at the church. And she said to me, you know, she was at another church. And somebody stood up. It was an Anglican church. And somebody stood up and said, why are there nobody in this church between the ages of 20 and the ages of 40? Why do we have to go to all these other churches to receive the Word of God. Why aren't we receiving it in our church? I don't want to duplicate what other churches are doing. 
But I want us to start doing what God wants us to do. What God wants you and me to do is to discuss the Word of God. To share the Word of God. To pray with each other. To share with each other. To be brothers and sisters in Christ with each other. If you've got a problem and you want somebody, you pick up the phone and you phone somebody that's sitting next to you and say, guys, can we go for a cup of coffee? I really need to download. And you know that when you finish that conversation, it's not going to be over every single web page or, or social media. What's it? Facebook, Twitter, what's the other ones? Chat, Snapchat, all these others that you are going to respect that person's privacy and pray with them. Until we become a family, we're not, we, we, we really are not trying very hard. That's what God wants from you and me. There are a number of people here that are hurt, that are struggling, that are going through a difficult time at the moment. They put on a brave face and they come to church and they smile and they say, I'm okay, thank you. And they come and they sit here and they cry to God on their own. If that's the kind of body that we are, then we deserve to die. Be the kind of body that are that embraces others as they come in and they pray and they, they weep and they let themselves be feeling there and where they need to be healed. Then we have an opportunity. So I conclude. As we come up today to receive the body and blood of Christ. I challenge you to ask Christ what you want Him to do with the body and the blood. What He's calling you to do. We're going to go into a time of prayer now. Normally, this is the time we say, find somebody that you've never ever spoken to and now we're going to peer peer you up. Today I'm going to say to you something very different. Find somebody that you feel comfortable with. One, two, three, not one, two or three of you. Get together. I'd like you to pray with each other. Guys, I don't want super big prayers. I don't need you to tell your whole life story to this person. I just want you to start forming, praying with each other as you feel led to pray. We're going to spend three minutes in prayer. Quarter two, we're going to finish, and then we're going to go on with the service. Find two or three people, pray with them.